Uh, one disclaimer that I was just talking to Sinead about is that normally when I talk about this kind of topic, I, I talk about it in about two hours. Um, so I can cram that into 15 minutes. If I'm speaking quite quickly, I do apologize. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. And hopefully you'll be able to see, which is, it's like a mirror image of what I'm sitting in front of here. Um, okay, can you, you can all see the slides okay there, can you? And you can see it, it's still in the screen for you, yeah? Yeah, yeah. sometimes it's just the way it displays is a bit funny. Okay, right, so let's get on with it then. So this is called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Desire in 15 Minutes. I'm afraid I'm probably not going to tell you everything you wanted to know about desire in 15 minutes. So that was a bit of a, an exaggerated title, but we'll see what we can do. All right. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to think about this question about when was the last time you felt desire? So we're going to come to that in a second. I decided I was going to Google desire and select the first photograph that appeared for this particular slide. And this was risky, as you can imagine. <laughs> but luckily, it's this one. And this one came from Psychology Today, which is interesting in itself. And as I scrolled down through the list of photographs, there were lots like this, um, or men and women in silhouette kissing, white men and white women, you know, heterosexual ones. Um, and this is part of the problem of our thinking about desire, one that we're going to get to. Um, so I want you to take a few seconds. I'm going to give you kind of 30 seconds of, of silence in a minute. And I want you to jot down what the last time you felt desire or what comes to mind when you think about desire. OK, and this articulation of desire is for you and you alone. I'm not going to ask you to share it or disclose it to anybody. Um, and you can scribble it out in a minute's time if you want to. All right. So let's just have 30 seconds of quiet. Okay, so you're probably only halfway through your, your thinking about this, I'm sure. There's probably a lot more there. Hopefully there's a lot more there. Um, but, you know, we're on, we're on the clock, so I better move on. I want you to just take a quick look at what you've written. What did your version of desire consist of? What adjectives did you use to describe it? Did you describe a need, a longing, something forbidden? Was it an eruption, a passion, an urge? Perhaps you outlined a more spiritual experience that overcame you or washed over you. What was the nature of the desire that you articulated? And now I want you to ask yourself if it felt a little bit shameful to write it down. <laughs> Did you look over your shoulder to see who was watching? Um, maybe it was Freud or Patriarchy who was watching you. Um, but something that's interesting to note before we get stuck into desire in this novel is how we tend to sexualize desire, to locate it in the genitalia, perhaps, or to associate it with childhood development, um, whether those memories are you know, positive or negative. In short, Freud is all around when we come to think about desire. And let's be clear, that's not really Freud's fault. Um, for a long time, I kind of rolled my eyes when I talked about Freud, because he seemed to be like this permanent regulator standing in the corner. Um, Freudian slips and Oedipal complexes and transference and sublimation and sure go one, we'll throw in the Alvin vagina dentata in there as well. It was like as if Freud was there to reinscribe female lack and to remind women that the only way out of their bind was through neuroses. Um, and just like those photographs that I mentioned earlier, uh, like this one, he is also very heteronormative. But then I watched this great video by Jack Halberstam, which I can send afterwards, um, where he tells us that actually it's not Freud's fault that this is the way that human beings are. He simply gave us a language to describe what is the way in which a patriarchal society functions and how desire gets screwed, if you pardon the pun, along the way. So that's where we're starting from. We're starting with Freud. So I want to offer two versions of a story, two versions of this story. Um, first, let's tell the kind of normative version. 
Once upon a time, there was a South Korean wife who was in all respects subordinate to her husband. She cooked for him, she washed his clothes, she had sex with him when he wanted. She said very little. She was completely unremarkable in every way, as her husband, Mr. Chong, describes her on the first page of the book, except for the fact that she didn't like wearing a bra. Every day she repeated these actions and on the surface, she looked like every other wife. She was normal in inverted commas. And now the kind of sliding doors version of the story, if you like, the real story of the vegetarian, which is more of a story of defiance. Once upon a time, there was a South Korean woman named Young Hai who was in all respects subordinate to her husband. She cooked for him, she washed his clothes, she had sex with him when he wanted. She said very little. She was completely unremarkable in every way as her husband, Mr. Chong, describes her on the first page of the book, except for the fact that she didn't like wearing a bra. Unremarkable, that is, until one night after a dream, Young Hai began removing all of the meat from the freezer and dumping it. If her lack of bra was her first act of defiance and this was her second, her third was not having her husband's shirt ready for him to go to work. For this, he called her insane. The first story is the story of a woman trapped in a patriarchal society and in a marriage that defines her. She operates from a position of utter normality, if you count, norma or if you count normality, that is, as being silent and docile. This is sanity, in inverted commas. Due to a very Freudian series of dreams, Young Hai's actions start to mark her out as insane, abnormal, and dangerous for a few reasons. And this is when she starts the path towards an alternative consideration of the body and of desire. Now we need someone other than Freud to chart this path. So in this talk, we're going to move away from Freud and towards the concepts of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. So Freudian rules that govern the family are evident in patriarchal heteronormative societies like our own and like the South Korean society that Young Hai inhabits. These involve the psychosexual development of children, including the formative Oedipal complex and the regulation of our unruly id, that which impatiently asserts its desires. But there are other regulatory practices in the family too that keep us in our places and which combine with Freudian psychoanalytic theories about the ways in which we negotiate authority and the developmental process. Respecting your elders, being obedient, repressing your fears or unacceptable thoughts and urges. All of these things are important in Freudian terms to our emergence as well-rounded and functioning, productive members of society. Expectations around food tie into this normative practice too. Think about your relationship with food and how much of that was planted in you, pardon the pun again, I like to pun, from a young age. Did your family eat together at the kitchen table? Who did the cooking? Were certain foods popular with everyone? Could you express displeasure at the provision of certain foods? Did you have to eat whatever was put in front of you? Megan Dean talks about the profound relationship between food and the regulation of women's bodies in a patriarchal society and about how food was, is also central to the creation of our own subjectivities. We are what we eat, so to speak. The ability to control one's desires around food, to engage in self-surveillance, to achieve a certain body type, that speaks to who we decide we are, what we value, again, how productive we can be. Chloe Taylor, as you can see here, asserts that diet and sexuality go hand in hand in determining our constitution of the self. And she's talking specifically about veganism here and how the pursuit of ethical veganism operates as a way of establishing one's identity as mainstream or outsider, pure or virile, masculine or feminine. But she connects food and sexuality, which is instructive here in this case. And so Young Hai's refusal to eat meat is a deliberate move away from the psychoanalytic nuclear family, from the constant negotiation of the parameters of acceptable behaviour. This moves us from Freudian psychoanalysis to Deleuze-Guattarian schizoanalysis. Schizoanalysis asks us to reconsider what is meant by mental and social instability. If we unplug ourselves from the capitalist machine and allow ourselves to think differently, we are always at risk of being considered mad. Deleuze and Guattari ask whether madness is truly a symptom of an unproductive mind or whether it is in fact the very opposite. They assert firstly that symptoms are not always negative and understand them as a process. 
the process then of becoming mad or becoming schizo, as they call it, is therefore not a descent into incoherence, but rather a process that enables the subject to, to connect directly with sights and sounds, to experience the world more intensely, to push the limits of life. So we must entertain the notion that perhaps it's not young high, but everybody else who's mad. So this novel is comprised of three parts told from three perspectives, none of which are young highs. However, her voice comes through like the voice of a ghost almost through a series of italicized sections in the first part, The Vegetarian, where she describes a number of dreams and incidents like her husband finding a sliver of metal in his dinner, the violent death of a family dog and the blockage in her chest that she will do anything to remove. So the three parts of the book are The Vegetarian, Mongolian Mark and Flaming Trees. The first is from Mr. Chong's first person perspective. The second is written in third person narration from the perspective of her unnamed brother-in-law. And the third, also third person narration, is from the perspective of Inhai, Young Hai's sister. Young Hai is observed, remarked upon, and analyzed throughout the text. She is frequently defined in relation to how much she deviates from the norms of the society she lives in. As already mentioned, Young Hai is discovered by her husband emptying the freezer of meat after a vivid dream in which she finds herself in the forest. And in this dream, there's a juxtaposition of families enjoying a barbecue while she remembers being in a barn with raw meat everywhere and pushing raw meat into her mouth. She's already alien to herself. She invokes the Freudian uncanny to describe her own face. She's a stranger to herself. And this schism enables her to act out of character. Her defiance of her husband and father and her refusal to eat meat to make others feel comfortable signifies the first shift that will result in the radical exploration of desire in the novel and her evolution from human to plant. In the Mongolian Mark section, her brother-in-law, a video artist who has become obsessed with creating a piece of work in which naked bodies adorned with painted flowers make love, calls to check on Young Hai one day and finds her unashamedly naked in her apartment. It is, in fact, his wife's throwaway remark about Young Hai's birthmark that inspired the concept, and she is the one who fuels it. He's always been drawn to her, her bluntness and directness, her lack of adornment, her androgyny. He says that she radiated energy like a tree that grows in the wilderness. But this desire is attended by deep and visceral psychoanalytic shame for the brother-in-law. As the text reads, like a cough that tickles the throat, he could feel a long suppressed yell threatening to burst out from deep inside him. Right at that moment, he wanted nothing more than to spit at those red lined eyes. He wanted to pummel his cheeks until the blood showed through beneath his black beard and smash his ugly lips swollen with desire with the sole of his shoe. So there are clearly Freudian forces at work here. Something is repressed, something is blocked and unable to pass. So for the brother-in-law, there's a confusing need to express his desire in predictable ways. The sex that he has with his wife during this section is disturbing and abusive and fails to bring him any pleasure either. But he attempts to channel something that he defines as inexpressible into a traditional marriage bed. It doesn't work. As Freud has predicted, his repressed desires are resulting in him becoming a pervert. And there are moments in his sexual encounter with Young Hai where she and he are both painted in bright, vivid colours, where we wonder about her degree of agency. What is she getting out of all of this? Deleuze and Guattari see psychoanalysis as restrictive, as cutting off access to our desire, because desire is founded upon psychoanalytic principles of lack. So we desire what we can't have. We repress trauma that we can't fully access. If we're women, we define ourselves in relation to the penis that we don't have, and the phallic void determines the way that, this, that the world sees us. So it's not until the brother-in-law really looks at her that the articulation of desire starts to resonate with the concept of the body without organs that Deleuze and Guattari discuss. And through this, it is suddenly possible to observe the process that she's undergoing and to understand the body as a site of revolution. Only then did he realize what it was that had shocked him when he'd, seen, when he'd first seen her lying prone on the sheet. This was the body of a beautiful young woman, conventionally an object of desire, and yet it was a body from which all desire had been eliminated. But this, but this was nothing so crass as carnal desire, not for her. Rather, or so it seemed, what she had renounced was the very life that her body represented. 
the sunlight that came splintering through the wide window, dissolving into grains of sand, and the beauty of that body, which through this, or which though this um, was not visible to the eye, was also ceaselessly splintering. So during these pages, desire is expressed very differently to how we might expect. Body and plant come together to create something that's anathema to those Freudian principles that govern sexual behavior. While arguably the brother-in-law's fetishization and fantasies about this scene are nothing but Freudian, he's also capable of seeing something beyond the limitations of traditional sexuality in Young High. And as I've said here, as um, he paints her, he feels not arousal, but something deep in his very core passing through him like a continuous electric shock. So the physical merges with the vegetal and the animalistic. Desire is, is glimpsed as electricity, Bodily fluids become tree sap. Um, Young High's flowers make her dreams stop. And she says, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. So we're going to talk about the body without organs in a second. I've mentioned it here on this slide. Um, but it's essentially a reorganization of the way in which the body is ordered. So it can be a literal body or an institutional body or a figurative body. Um, and it allows access here to a fuller sense of what desire is. Not sexual or necessarily bound up with the sexual at least, but instead bound up with that idea that intensities are allowed access to those parts of us that we explain away or that we ignore in the grand scheme of how our bodies function. So in The Vegetarian, Young Hai is finally freed of the fetters that control her thoughts and desires. And actually, incidentally, all of these are restrictions that occur on account of the family structure, because that's where it all begins. But her connection with the painted flowers enables um, a different alternative depiction of desire. So earlier in this part of the novel, she's described by her brother-in-law like this, whether human, animal or plant, she could not be called a person. But then she wasn't exactly some feral creature either, more like a mysterious being with qualities of both. And so this ambiguity or merging or whatever you want to call it, um, that creates a space in which desire is free to be expressed differently. And similarly, her, her brother-in-law experiences desire in a way that's unfamiliar and a reorganization of all of his bodily experiences of desire up to this point. He notes the thrilling energy that flows out of some unknowable place inside his body to collect on the tip of his brush as he paints her. But he's instantly returned to shame after the act because he's confronted by the familial responsibility that he's temporarily rejected. So he's still regulated by the superego, by his conscience, through guilt when his wife discovers them. And his wife in high um, calls the emergency services. So why does she do this? You know, why doesn't she just rail and shout at him and give out and maybe put him on social media and shame him? Well, we're conditioned to experience family life in the way that is that it is understood by psychoanalysis through laws and rules, order, appropriateness, sibling relationships, loyalty, truth. These are all the things that kind of, um, you know, underpin the way that we experience that. And so all of these things are designed to in some way restrict the individual. Um, and to create of him or her a fully functioning, ordered human being that crucially is productive to society. So psychoanalysis and capitalism kind of go hand in hand here. And if we think about Inhai's reaction to something that defies family, that defies structure, that defies the human, actually, because they're kind of becoming plant together, that defies traditional desire, that defies sisterly affection, that defies love, her reaction is to see perversity and disorder, something that's alien to the productive, productive functioning of society and that needs to be rectified. In psychoanalytic terms, if we express that which defies these rules, we are perverts, like the brother-in-law. If we repress it, we are neurotics. But Young Hai is neither because her body no longer subscribes to these rules. Um, so Young Hai's body is a body without organs because fundamentally she rejects the form of normality that society offers to her or perhaps more accurately forces her to accept up to this point. 
Um, and here becoming plant is a perfectly appropriate thing to do if you subscribe to Deleuze and Guattari. But the body without organs courts danger too. Um, Deleuze and Guattari warned that if the reorganization of the body results in new intensities and new expressions of desire that are liberated from psychoanalysis, then this is really a very positive thing. But if you become a slave to it, you essentially just replace one set of rules for another. So there is effort and often pain involved in creating and maintaining the body without organs. Um, it is ground zero for intensity. It is ground zero of intensities. And Deleuze and Guattari describe it in a way that is difficult to grasp. They say it's not a place. It isn't space. It isn't in space, they say. They say it's matter that occupies space to a given degree. And so that's a really difficult kind of concept, I think, that's, you know, it's hard to grasp. Um, but I suppose what they mean is that the body without organs may not be visible to the naked eye. We might not recognize one when we see one on the surface because it's about the way in which the body without organs generates and circulates a type of energy and intensity that rejects traditional hierarchy and order. Um, and because this is often a dangerous enterprise, sometimes things can go wrong. So what Deleuze and Guattari say here in the quote is that it is a very delicate experimentation since there must not be any stagnation of the modes or slippage in type. The masochist and the drug user court these ever-present dangers that empty their body without organs instead of filling them. Um, so when Deleuze and Guattari mentioned the masochist and the drug user, we can understand a couple of things. Firstly, we can understand the way the body without organs functions, because if we think about the way that the body is reorganized by drugs, well, certain sensations are heightened and others are dulled. So we experience reality differently. And all of this is kind of good in one way. We're not subject to the things that stratify our lives on a daily basis, the rules, the etiquette, but also the restriction, the limitation, you know. But when the desire for drugs overtakes the body, then the body becomes its own fascist. And that loses the power then. The body loses the power that the body without organs has generated in the first place. So I don't want to give away the ending of the novel. If you haven't already read it, you're going to have to now to find out what happens to Young Hai. Instead, I'm just going to return to where we started. So go back to your own little scribblings on desire. Um, and I want you, you know, I'm not going to offer any answers at the end of the session, I'm afraid. I'm going to finish by asking some questions and leaving you with those questions. So the first one is, what was your articulation of desire associated with? How does it connect with other forces that normalize you or contain you? And how might you escape or experience that desire differently? Thanks a lot, folks. That's all. <laughs>